Okay, welcome everybody. Happy February in the month of love. And we're celebrating and honoring Black History Month as well. Uh, we have an exciting panel today. I'm going to start the recording right now. So we are recording. Um, today we wanted to showcase Black superstars of ICS. Our panel is comprised of esteemed business champions, researchers, scholars, and change agent influencers that are advocates of also diversity and inclusion. We welcome comments and dialogue, but please put them in the chat room and we will get to them as time permits. We will learn about the journeys of every single panelist and their contributions to the advancement of computer science in academia as well as the business world. We aim to make this also a learning experience and to help foster a dialogue of inclusivity and respect about racial injustice. Um, so we have our panelists. Um, I will let everybody introduce themselves um, one by one. Uh, we have Gisette Johnson, who is a PhD candidate uh, for 2021 in informatics, Professor Roderick Crooks, um, Dr. Mamadou Diallo, uh, Brian McCurtis, who uh, I actually shared a couple classes with, or at least lab time with, um, my friend Jason Collins, who I've known for over 20 years since we've actually gone to high school together, and we've kept in touch, and then Anthony Mays. Uh, Uh, just wanted to let you know of some future events. Uh, next month, March, is Women's History Month. So fr Friday, March 5th at 12 o'clock, we will have a panel of women that we will have a similar format. We're also looking for future speakers for the ongoing months, April onwards, and we will return back to our Lunch and Learn format where we will discuss IT um, topics and subject matter experts. We are also looking forward to doing some game nights and scavenger hunts. We are on AntNet, um, so here's the link for AntNet, and please, you know, check us out on um, icsanteaters.org, where you can find links to all our social media. Again, this is being uh -huh. recorded, and without further ado, uh, Anthony, why don't you tell us about your background? Um, if you can oh, tell sorry. us your name, your graduation year, um, your career path, and where you are today, and your challenges and successes. Sure. So hi, I'm Anthony D. Mays, uh, software engineer at Google, and I graduated in 2005, according to this slide. Um, not that I remember, it's been a while. Um, I uh, grew up in Compton uh, as a foster kid and um, a former physical and sexual abuse victim. And uh, I fortunately, um, through school, found an opportunity to um, use computers and loved it uh, from the very first time that I had the opportunity to, to interact with them. And I wanted to do more of it and didn't quite know um, what, what to do. So uh, it ran into some lab instructors that began to uh, share uh, what they knew about computers with me. And so I learned about the internet, um, you know, go for uh, <laughs> email and, and all that stuff. Um, around high school, uh, one of the computer lab instructors told me I could get paid doing this. So I was like, sweet and decided to attend the University of California, Irvine to get a degree in computer science, where unfortunately I was one of only at most two uh, black folks who'd be in uh, uh, a class, in a computer science class. Um, you know, it, I just didn't encounter a lot of people who look like me and came from where I came from. And, uh, you know, I had aspirations to get to Google, tried and failed. Um, so I absolutely knew that Google was never going to hire somebody uh, who looked like me and who came from where I came from. But in 2013, had the opportunity to um, learn what I needed to, to learn, study really, really hard, and was able to get a job. And so I've been at Google for over seven years now, and I've made it my goal to help prepare um, uh, whoever and from wherever and to help prepare candidates for uh, getting uh, software engineering roles in tech and learning what they need to do to be better engineers. So uh, that's a bit about me. Great, thank you. That's a great story. Um, so Mamadou, do you want to go next and tell us a little bit about your background and your journey? Uh, yes. So uh, yeah, thank you for the, for the panel and thank you to our audience. And uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, very important for me to do this uh, during this uh, month. Uh, so I'm originally from Guinea in West Africa. So this is a, 
a very tiny country in the west part of Africa. So I grew up there and- uh, Do you so, want to put your slide deck up? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay. Give me one second. Uh, give me one second. So I'm using a government laptop, so give me just one second. Okay. Uh, can you, I shared with you. I'll do it, I'll do it. Yeah. Can you do it on your side, please? Yeah. You can go ahead, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'm, yeah, original, like I said, from Guinea in West Africa is a very small country, the best part of Africa. Uh, so the, my native language is Pular. So what also your language for the country is French. So uh, I, when I went to school, I had to study French. And uh, also I had to study a little bit of Arabic. Uh, I'm a Muslim. So I immigrated to the United States in 1999. Uh, so since then, um, I'm here. Uh, my first goal was to go to school, uh, kind of um, uh, get a degree, uh, be able to, uh, to work with, with my degree. So the first thing I did was to go to Coastline Community College. So at that time, I didn't know anything in English. So I could not even communicate with my aunt, who is uh, 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 from here, I didn't know how to speak French or Pular. And uh, from there, after getting a little bit understanding of the English language, then I moved to Orange Coast uh, College, where I uh, did my AA degree. So I ended up so then there with the support of the school completed an AA degree. Then from there, I transferred to UCI. So that's uh, when I transferred to UCI. So I had already the AA degree. So from, uh, from there, I kind of uh, work with uh, the camp office there and, and be able to apply to go to grad school uh, and then end up go, going to, to grad school at UCI. So, uh, as you can see, it took me a while before I, I get the degree for various reasons. Uh, so the bachelor degree happened at UCI happened in 2004. Uh, I got an uh, MS degree in informatics in 2006. And then I get an MS degree in computer science in 2012. Then I left at UCI. I went to start working for um, the job I'm doing right now with the Naval Information Welfare Center Pacific uh, is part of the Department of the Navy. So, and then I came back to UCI around to, uh, in 2015. And then uh, the next uh, three years I, I completed the degree uh, finally. So um, talking a little bit about my career path is really, I wanna say this is a, a, a good place to kind of say a little bit about how I coming from uh, Guinea uh, uh, ended up going all the way to, to grad school. So I was had a lot of support. So I get a lot of support from, from the community. Uh, at the OCC, I have the extended opportunity uh, EOPS. And then uh, um, at UCI, we have the camp office. And then I was in the MICNER program. I was in the bridge program. And then I ended up being also in the, uh, the School of Civil Service for National Science Foundation. That's how I ended up uh, be working for the government. So uh, currently my title, yeah, the official title is scientist. But what I do is really, I'm a science and technology manager. And we, uh, my role, what I do is to do conduct, monitor uh, science and, and techniques, uh, technology activities. So to help the Navy address all the, those challenges, including basic and uh, applied research. Uh, that all this is to support uh, the Navy acquisition program. 
So that's kind of a, a quick uh, a intro. So I will talk more about as we go about uh, myself. Perfect. Thank you so much. So yeah, we'll talk about some of the other topics later. Yes, yes. Um, what we have next is Gisette, who is our PhD candidate currently, and she's actually focusing on disabilities in her research. So she'll discuss more about that. Hello, everyone. My name is Gisette Johnson. I am a third year PhD student in the Department of Informatics studying human um, computer interaction with an infinite with an emphasis on um, accessibility. Uh, just a quick correction, I will not be graduating this year. I wish. Um, I actually will most likely be graduating in two more years. So I have two more years until you can call me Dr. Johnson. Um, but my research focuses on designing um, virtual support uh, systems for people with dementia. Um, so yeah, that's the gist of, oh, I received a, um, my bachelor's of computer science, my BS in computer science from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia in 2015. I also received um, from there, I went to get my master's of science in human computer interaction from Vanderbilt University in uh, 2018. Um, and now I'm here, so yeah. You've traveled quite, quite <laughs> around the country, right? Huh, repeat that? You have uh, traveled quite around the country for your education. <laughs> yes. <laughs> are you staying? Are you staying in California? Is this the best? So far, it has been the best, but we'll see because the family's on the East Coast. So. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay. Thank you. And Professor Roger Crooks uh, next. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jezette, can we call you Dr. Johnson prematurely to manifest <laughs> that it will happen? I think we should just round up and promote it so that we make clear that we want it to happen. It's definitely going to happen. But it sure. is going to happen. So maybe we'll just start now. That's okay. What I'm uh, her. <laughs> um, so I don't want to take too much time. I actually would like to hear more from the students who are here, from Jezette and Anthony. But again, I'm uh, Assistant Professor Roderick Crooks. I've been in the Department of Informatics. Uh, I was here first as a postdoc for two years, so this is my third year as an assistant professor. I am originally from South Los Angeles, not super far from where Anthony is from. You know Hyde Park, Anthony? You know that library that's right there um, at the corner of like Florence and Van Ness? I grew up like one block from there. Anyway, um, so that's where I was originally from, but like Jazette, I went all over for my education. Um, I came back to California to do a PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles. And so getting a job uh, here in Southern California was definitely a, a, a lifetime goal. So I'm very close to where I started, but also quite far. Um, and then I'll just leave it at that. Um, I think if people are interested in hearing more about my research interests or projects that I'm working on, they are broadly speaking in uh, urban education and technological innovation as applied to the provision of public services to racialized and minoritized communities. And then also from the other perspective, how racialized and minority, minoritized communities have organized uh, through various kinds of institutions and community-based organizations to resist harms caused by academia and the tech industries in our communities. Yes, that sounds really interesting. So I think, yeah, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that um, as we go through some of the other questions, because I, I do think your research is very relevant. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. And thank you again for being here. Uh, okay, Brian Curtis, can you tell Everybody. us about your story? Sure. Um, hi there. I'm Brian McCurtis, based here in Austin, Texas. Happy to be here and thank you to UCI ICS for the invitation. Uh, so I graduated from UCI in 2000 with a bachelor's in information computer science. Uh, right after graduating, I went to management consulting. So started with the likes of Deloitte Consulting early on and moving on to KPMG. And I started as an IT analyst, really focused on many different sectors. So I was working in public sector, working on justice information systems, such as criminal case management systems, working with local law enforcement and district attorneys, and moved on to working in insurance and healthcare. Uh, but eventually I evolved to focus on IT project management. 
uh, started to work with companies to manage their enterprise systems. And I was with Nokia for about 10 years and was working in uh, Europe and other places. But it was at that time where I started to narrow my focus. Um, I really started to focus on Latin America. Uh, so I had a regional focus and then I started to manage projects in Brazil. And then I started to focus on Latin America, Brazil, telecommunications, logistics. So for me, I always believe that uh, success is in the niches. So it was important for me to uh, focus and have this funnel approach to my career. And so I, I wanted to continue to evolve that. So I always believe that becoming very good at something that's very specific makes you even more valuable, at least in the corporate world. So my niche and career path is project management, Latin America, Brazil. Um, so that required that I move to Brazil, live in Brazil, uh, learn Brazilian Portuguese and uh, learn and adapt to the business culture and also sort of serve as that bridge between our, our U.S. Uh, stakeholders in Brazil and getting teams to work together. So that was exciting, still exciting for me. Um, I'm currently with Apple, been with Apple for about eight years this year, and that's my focus area. That's my niche. Um, so that's what I do, and um, that's where I am today. So a little bit about me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I didn't know you knew Brazilian. That's awesome. We're working. Uh, is uh, Jason on? I can't see him. Okay, maybe he's not on. <laughs> I texted him. So, um, so I guess we'll just wait um, when Jason joins so he can fill in. Uh, so the next. Oops, sorry. Uh, the next couple of questions I had were related to ICS. So um, Anthony, you can start again. Uh, you know, what kind of made you choose ICS? You talked about it a little bit. Um, do you have an area of expertise and then what kind of excites you and you know, keeps you in ICS and things like that? Yeah, so, um, so the, the first answer to that question is money. Like I wanted to get paid and it was very clear to me that doing computer science is gonna get a brother paid um, in, in, in moving up out the hood. Not to stay out the hood, but to empower me then to be able to come back and do some um, some positive things, which it definitely has enabled me to do. So that was the first reason. Second reason why I joined ICS is because I wasn't all the way sure what I wanted my specialization to be. I started off um, sort of with um, working with operating systems, doing basic installation, you know, working around with that stuff. Um, my mentor in high school did um, uh, basically network design. Uh, in network administration. And so that seemed attractive. Plus it'd be an opportunity to get outside every now and again if I needed to fix a router and, and stuff like that. Um, and then, um, but my first internship, uh, which I, I was placed uh, in my first internship by way of a, a nonprofit called Inroads. And uh, that exposed me to uh, software development. And um, funny story, the first year of my, uh, first summer of my internship, um, I didn't know what to do. So I built an app for my wife that was themed around, well, my girlfriend at the time, she became my wife. So computer science works. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so I was like, okay, well, maybe this software engineering thing is the way to go. And I wanted to um, get exposure to a, a wide variety of areas within computer science to figure out where I might best fit in. So, you know, I appreciate uh, what, what uh, Brian was talking about in, in terms of like, uh, you know, figuring out where I can go and dive deep and, and, and get smart. And, uh, so I, I really appreciated the breadth of, of things that I was exposed to in computer science and also for things outside of uh, my ICS degree, um, you know, writing was probably the most important um, of the classes and topics that I covered in college because it's communication more than anything else that I've had to apply um, in spades beyond just uh, the, the tech skills that, that I use, many of which um, were reinforced in the working world, not necessarily in the classroom. So, um, you know, I, I, for, for me, one of the things that I'm passionate about um, and one of the reasons why I um, work sort of in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space now is because of my the experience that I had in college. I spent a lot of time doubting myself. I spent a lot of time thinking that I wasn't like everyone else that I was in some ways tangibly different um, or, or meaningfully different, maybe I should say. 
uh, from my colleagues in computer science. And, you know, just graduating with a degree at ICS for me was a game changer, um, being a first generation uh, college graduate. And so um, what I represented for myself, for my family, for my community, uh, what was something important and non-trivial. And um, it, it's, it's amazing how in the spaces that I'm in now, we talk a lot about, you know, second career, talk a lot about, um, uh, you know, entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, it seems like the world is, is, is my oyster now as a software engineer at Google. But back then, just getting a job and being a productive member of society was a high uh, ideal and goal for me. And so much of my career, um, you know, in ICS and coming out of ICS has really been about expanding the scope of, of what I've been able to see possible for me and for my family and uh, growing in that. And so um, I, I think that um, ICS was instrumental in, in helping to set me up for that kind of success and for that broadened uh, view of the world, um, not just of the tech world, but of the world in general. Um, and, and I want to help empower other students um, who are at UCI or other um, places to make that transition in a way that's smoother than, than I did. Because um, certainly it took me um, from the time that I graduated high school, 13 years or 12 years to get to Google. I could have been there probably in four, uh, but I didn't know what I know now. Um, and I, I think I'm passionate about sharing that knowledge with other students and with other people so that they can chart, um, I think, a trajectory uh, that helps them to succeed far beyond uh, where, uh, where I might be able to. Um, an interesting question, you know, it's not something we specifically discussed, but since you bring it up with the whole college education, um, you know, Google and some other companies, right, I believe Facebook and maybe Apple even, they are actually saying college degrees are not now required. Um, do you think that's kind of good or bad? I mean, I know since you help with the technical recruiting or, you know, doing all that, what, what is your take on that a little bit? So uh, number one, I think the, the brass tax is that um, having a degree is still important. Um, it, 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 you may not need it as much to get in the door uh, and to get the job, but I think that if you want to experience career growth, I think that if you want to move in some of the more lucrative uh, spaces within tech, you want to have that. Um, and you know, even if you can get to those spaces without a degree, I think you'll get there faster if you have a degree along with all the other um, uh, proper motivations and problem solving and thinking that you need to have. And um, on my LinkedIn profile, uh, I, I engaged in that very debate, I think last week. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, talking about um, the importance that a college degree still carries. And again, re remember that it's not just the tangible job skills that, that you may learn or the theory underlying those job skills. The communication was very important. The time that I spent in African-American studies at UCI was important and yeah. has informed the work that I do now, not just as a technologist, but as a BEI advocate. And that's not something that I would have had the opportunity to do had it not been for the education that I received at UC Irvine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, so I, I think that, um, for me at the very least, um, college, having the degree was very important. Having the education I received at UCI was a very important foundation uh, upon which I've been able to build things that I didn't anticipate being able to build as a software engineer. Right. Yeah, it, it, yeah interesting, right? Because we're talking about it and we are all obviously alumni, um, but the interviews are potentially moving to hey, you don't even need a degree. But let's um, talk about ICS and why you chose it, Mamadou. Um, you have three ICS degrees, so. Uh, yes. Uh, so for me, uh, so I started my schooling uh, in Guinea. So uh, like I said, the official language is French. Uh, so when I was there, I, my first major was math. So I loved math. I, I, I kind of, I know I'm good at math. So at that time, uh, ICS was uh, just starting. So I ended up taking a class uh, in math where, where we enter, get introduced to algorithm. 
So that's how I fell in love with uh, the ICS as a field. So I started studying that ICS when I was in Guinea. So when I moved here in the US, uh, the challenge with the language assimilation, the challenge with the culture and all this. So as soon as I started studying here, I realized uh, uh, at that time, I need something that has to be again in that area, in the technical area. So I ended up uh, after um, uh, going through the AA degree and uh, picking up again to continue working on, on ICS. So I realized that that's really at that time was an advantage for me. So I don't have to uh, uh, struggle too much about uh, being very well at uh, writing or talking in English. So that was a one way that helped me to be actually be able to uh, be integral part of the school when I was at OCC. I even ended up doing um, tutoring into the math uh, center at OCC where we teach student uh, math and, and, and CS courses. That really, at that time, at, at the same time also, the ICS industry was booming. We had Google, we have all these companies uh, coming out. So I find that myself, that was really kind of the right place uh, for me. So when I moved to UCI, uh, the challenge was uh, the fact that, uh, uh, again, I was very, it, 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 my minority, I want to say. So all my classes I took at UCI, I ended up being the only one, like one black person in, in, in those classes. So, but again, uh, be, because of my background, because of, uh, 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 I'm just doing something that I like, I really enjoyed uh, uh, taking those classes. That really helped me to stay uh, focused, to work on uh, the ICS field. And that's uh, what pushed me uh, through the program at UCI, and also, I want to say, um, having uh, this program I mentioned earlier, this uh, diversity program, uh, they did help a lot uh, for me to be able to go through uh, this process through my education at UCI, going from the bachelor degree, going to the master's degree, and then going to the PhD degree. So again, uh, ICS was a kind of something that I, I, I liked a lot. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Gisette, what, what made you pick ICS? And, you know, we know your uh, area of research uh, and what excites you in general about ICS? Yeah. So I got interested. Well, by the age of nine, I knew I wanted to work in computers. I used to tell people all the way up through, let's say, college that I wanted to be a computer tech. I had no idea. I just knew I liked engaging with the computers. I was like the uh, stay at home uh, technician mm -hmm. as a um, child. And uh, since then, well, during my freshman year um, at Spelman College, I was introduced to research. And um, they during that research project, they told us to think about um, something that you would want to develop, uh, something that you want to do on the side, right? And my, during that time, my grandmother was uh, dealing with um, dementia, the, the later stages of dementia. And um, I was like, okay, I'll develop a music therapy application because of the idea of music, helping people with dementia and things like that. Um, and continued on um, throughout my, from my freshman year through my senior year. I um, pretty much what, what excited me and kept me in uh, the computer science degree was research um, because I wasn't that great at my classes. Um, but being able to actually put what, I'm, what I am learning in classes to my research was amazing. But also what um, for HCI specifically or informatics, what made me um, come to like UCI and continue this type of work is the fact that we can change the way we're designing technologies to think specifically about how we're designing it for the community first, right? Um, most often these technologies aren't designed thinking about the communities first. So that's where I'm 
Um, and a lot of many, many other researchers are stepping in to do that specific um, thing, so. Professor uh, Roderick, what, uh, you know, you're again a PhD, you're doing research, you're teaching, what excites you? What made you kind of choose ICS and your area of expertise? Uh, sure, so I definitely wanted to work in uh, a public institution in California. So uh, as a native Californian, that was something that was important to me. Um, ICS in particular has a long tradition of social informatics research. So research that is empirical, but also critical. So I guess uh, one thing I thought was that for the kind of work I wanted to do to maybe rethink what the category of the social is, particularly in a way that could include consideration of the racial, I thought that this might be a place, I knew that this would be a good place to do it. And then of course, um, when you are a professor, you wanna go somewhere where they have excellent students. And so that's certainly this place. Sorry, uh, Brian, what made you choose ICS and your area of expertise there? You're, you're in a very corporate environment and working on big enterprise kind of solutions. So what excites you about that? Yeah, so about UCI and ICS, what attracted me. So like most on the panel, I was always into computers and networking and programming and ever since a young age, junior high school. So I was a nerd and still quite am a nerd. Uh, but having said that, I knew early on like computer science was for me. Um, but like Mamadou had mentioned, <clears throat> for him, he was strong in math. For me, I was not. Uh, math was not a strength for me. It, it took me uh, longer to come to the conclusion, but I recognized that early. Um, and I said, well, if I'm going to do computer science, I'm going to need to commit uh, to uh, putting more time in math. And, and I did so, um, you know, with the help of, of, of course, uh, colleagues, et cetera. Um, what stood out about UC Irvine is I recall when evaluating schools, most schools says, OK, congrats, see you in the fall. And, and so, OK. Um, however, UC Irvine uh, really reached out and said, look, we want to invite you. Uh, to come to campus the summer before your classes and take your classes early. Uh, and through the California Alliance for Minority Participation Camp, um, I was able to go there during the summer, take the same classes I would take in the fall and meet, of course, tons of uh, great uh, people who are friends today. Um, and so I would say that by doing that, I really gained confidence because when uh, when fall started, I was in a sea of people who did not look like me, um, and I knew where to go. I knew where the buildings were. I knew what to expect in those first, in that first semester. Um, I knew what a computer lab was. Uh, so that gave me confidence, and it, I felt like I belonged, and it helped me to uh, also make friends, and, and, and sometimes, you know, you have so much to deal with. You're dealing with you know, a new place, uh, new cultures. And, and so that, uh, that really was, uh, was a discerning factor for me. Um, and then lastly, just about the computer science program itself. I mean, being able to work with Dr. Deb Richardson, uh, did research requirements management and UML modeling uh, with her and her team and Professor Beth harnick Spiro, who I understand is on the call now on technical writing, being able to connect with them during the summer and do research uh, was exciting and also uh, propelled me to uh, towards graduation for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, so some of the other questions that we have since we have some time, um, I have a few and I think um, they kind of match to what some of the questions in the chat also are. Um, I think a few of you have kind of mentioned, but I'll leave it open so anybody can answer these. Uh, have you've mentioned the camp program at UCI? Have there been other champions or mentors or people who have kind of inspired you um, or helped you to, you know, be at where you are? Anyone can answer that. <laughs> I was trying not to be first to, to, to mix it up, so. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. But um, yeah, so there, there were, um, although I didn't um, do the full camp uh, program where I took classes before um, getting to college, 
um, I, uh, there was a unique initiative the year that I um, received my acceptance letter where um, the Black Student Union worked with uh, the uh, admissions office and was able to provide a uh, experience specifically for, uh, for Black students to come and, and get a tour of the campus, um, sit in, in some classes, and then have a sleepover at the Rosa Parks house where I ended up um, uh, actually staying my sophomore year. And uh, it was great to see that there was uh, a network of support uh, available to me. And uh, that was very, very valuable. Uh, I'd also had the opportunity to work with, um, uh, oh, I can't remember uh, the name of the program. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to, um, to interact with uh, programs on campus that were focused, for, um, focused on underrepresented groups. Um, nowadays, I um, am very grateful to the Office of Access and Inclusion and for oppor opportunities that I've had to work with um, that office, uh, which is a joint partnership between um, the computer science and um, in, in engineering departments, I believe. So that was, uh, was also good. Um, on, honestly, there are too many um, mentors uh, to name uh, because there are so many people who were willing from from professors to um, to after uh, school, right. um, you know, uh, managers and, and other people who worked in the department. Um, I think that if I were to sort of um, leave a message for folks who are um, for students who are listening or, or maybe even um, other alums who are um, on the call, uh, I, I tried to make it a point to learn how to engage with the opportunities around me um, because my inclination was to hide and to isolate uh, because I came from an underrepresented background and not really to deal with anything or, or anybody else. And I didn't want to be seen as a special case needing a bunch of extra support either. Um, and I eventually had to learn and grow into um, putting myself out there and being willing to uh, partner with um, with other students, with other organizations, to just take advantage of, of um, the resources that were available, and to see that as a good thing, not as a not as a, a bad thing or a cheating or as some indication that I'm not um, fit enough. Um, you know, as a as as a Bible student, um, you know, if you want friends, show yourself friendly, and I think that that was an important adjustment for me. Um, coming into my college years and then into professional life. Networking is, is everything. Yeah, and I think that applies to almost anyone, but yeah, just asking for help and being open to it and, you know, and so, reaching out. So. Um, so I'll move on to another question. Um, I, will, yeah, I really wanted to talk a little bit about, about uh, this uh, poem, maybe just you gotta keep it short. Yeah. So uh, I think I, I'm in a very good position to talk about uh, this kind of support, uh, this kind of program you have in, not only at the community, uh, uh, community um, college level, but also at the university level. So when I was at OCC, there ha they had a program, they still have a program called the EOPS, Excellent Program, uh, uh, opportunity program and services. So that program, I have to say, that helped me a lot as a new immigrant in, in the US, uh, having not, uh, not only la uh, having to learn the language and also having uh, financial uh, difficulties. So the program was really supporting not only financially, but it had moral support. So even though if you, no, you you can do it. You have the knowledge, but sometimes just a society. Sometimes the way you interact with people can push you back. So that's a program. These counselors I had to meet with uh, one person named Vida and another, Clyde Phillips. They helped helped me significantly to overcome these kind of challenges, where I can actually ignore what is going around, just focusing on what I can do. How, how can I uh, improve myself uh, being, being a student? And then from that, I, when I transferred to UCI, I, uh, I was directly selected to be 
uh, in the uh, MCNEL program, which is another uh, diversity program many of, many of you may be familiar with. So through that program, the idea was to support the student to make sure that they are comfortable, they uh, can excel, not being seen as even though minority, but being minority not to push them back, not to push them down. So that's a program who supported us. We had a, a group of people there at that time, and then we all ended up uh, completing our bachelor degrees, and then we went to the, the master's program, and then we had another program called the Bridge to the Doctorate program. And that's what motivated us again more to willing to work harder. We to, we now kind of realize we have a place. We 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 can do this. So uh, that's helped us significantly, not only financially, but uh, like I said, the, uh, the social support, the moral support to tell you, uh, even though you are a minority in, in the school, you can do it. And then that's how. Uh, uh, I ended up uh, doing the uh, master's program at UCI and then uh, apply again went to the, the, the PhD program. So again, uh, being a minority, I have to say uh, uh, in science is, is very challenging. And then we do need this social support, we need these so social activities uh, that help you. In particular, I wanna say young people to understand uh, that uh, they can do it, uh, uh, they just need to uh, uh, push themselves and, and be, uh, 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 get the support. So that's what, what I wanted to mention uh, quickly before we move forward. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so this one uh, question is, how have you dealt with, um, you know, maybe especially in the workplace, obviously we've talked about how it kind of has been at UCI with the subtle everyday systemic racism or what are common, misconceptions maybe people have and maybe Professor Crooks you can talk a little bit more um, you know I've attended some lectures at UCI about this uh, implicit or unintentional bias and how that is now factored in as IT is growing and AI is growing and data science um, and you know what we should be aware of as IT people as developers um, of not only having this as a human trait but potentially now machine learning this trait. Sure, thanks. Um, uh, I definitely want to thank Anthony and Mamadou for um, bringing their own personal perspective and kind of animating their own lived experiences as they are pursuing their own careers. So I think that's important and I definitely don't want to diminish um, that approach. But we also have to simultaneously remain aware of the systemic racism, the, the, the cishet patriarchy and white supremacy that constitutes the ground that the, against which a figure like diversity, equity, and inclusion appears. So what I'm saying is how can we simultaneously be supportive of efforts of diversity, equity, and inclusion? How can we simultaneously support uh, our own communities and kind of build networks of support that way, but simultaneously uh, name and dispute larger systemic issues. So I don't have a great answer for how to do this. I'm just saying we have to make sure that we do not allow our own personal and important lived experiences to serve as an alibi for the systemic racism and sexism that marks all powerful institutions. So those are corporate institutions, but also public institutions like the university. This is, the, this is another common thread that we could talk about. So in my own work, I say, uh, try to forge connections between people who are uh, confronting the same problems, but at different levels and in different ways. And so this is not a perfect solution because there are many power imbalances that make this kind of work difficult. But I think for sure there are many community organizers, for example, who do this work and they have this expertise in how to connect grassroots struggles to larger systemic problems. So the, in this respect, then I would say the technology space and the academic space are unremarkable in that like many other domains of sociality, they are marked by extreme inequality. Yes, and um, anyone want to chime in, Brian or? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just talk from my perspective, you know, to add to that, you know, you mentioned racism and, and you mentioned diversity. And, you know, in regards to racism, many times we automatically think of stark, blatant racism and, and that happens to many, if not all of us. But also there is just a frequent inherent bias uh, many times and assumptions based on us as professionals and microaggressions that over time will take a toll on anybody. 
And those are sometimes just basic assumptions by our colleagues, our colleagues that do not look like us, but they may think that, or they may be shocked to learn that we're just like them. We shop where they shop. We travel to where they travel. We do what they do. In the sense that sometimes it's hard for people just to connect on a human level. They assume that as minorities, as professionals, we are different. We do different things. So just starting from the beginning, not having that foundation and based on inherent bias can just make it hard, hard to connect. And then, and also just inherent classifications of people. Um, situations I've seen in which you have, uh, uh, on one side, you may have uh, a certain subset of people, Caucasians be labeled as enthusiastic, passionate, challenging, really thinking outside the box. While people who look like us are maybe a little bit aggressive. You're, you're a little direct. Um, maybe let's tone that down, right? Well, wait a second. I'm communicating in the same form. I'm just as passionate. What makes me different, right? So is that stark calling somebody a name? No, but it's things like that in the corporate environment many times that add up. And it's something that we have to have strategies to deal with. And then my second quick point is on diversity. You know, I was really surprised to learn that today in general, many people think about diversity as giving someone who's not capable an opportunity, giving a handout to someone just because we should. To me, diversity is a core component of success, core component of innovation, period. To me, diversity is taking a different view on co complex problems, which produces innovation. Um, if you have a homogeneous view on the same problems, you're going to get solutions in the same realm, in the same area. Um, but by bringing different views and diverse views, you naturally start to get unique solutions. So when I speak to corporate or organizations about diversity, I, I try to chime, on, chime in on, look, this is more about why you need to do it. But not only why you need to do it, but why it's going to make you even more successful and how it's going to make you take you to the next level simply because you have different views, different perspective and different ways to, to think about problems. So I just wanted to add that. Yes, I feel like you hit the nail on the head by saying that I, I fully agree. You said it so eloquently, too. So I, you know, yeah, I, I, I very much agree. And, you know, I think we will have a similar discussion next month with women um, and women leaders and panelists. And that, that kind of sentiment holds true of like, if a woman says something, it's like, you know, not viewed the same way as if maybe a man had said it or something. So, you know, kind of a quick comment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the word diversity, um, amazing word, but often um, a lot of things get packed on top of diversity. Um, to exclude the Black person again. Um, and we should explicitly state what we're talking about um, when we're seeking to diversify an environment and things like that. This is just adding on, but also I just want to, that's something that I'm constantly thinking about and discussing with other individuals. Yes, diversity is great, but at this current moment, diversity also means um, everyone except the white straight male, right? Um, and if sometimes when we say diverse, we also mean black, but that doesn't really go hand in hand because we're also at the bottom of that, that word. But that's just something that um, I also, I often think about, um, so yeah. Uh, I'll jump in uh, too because I think I, I, I like the line of this discussion. You know, one of the things that was uh, very important for me. So I, I think in, in the work that I do as a um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, advocate, if you will, um, much of what I do is around communication, um, around defining terminology, as Gisette was talking about, around. Um, bringing some some language around um, the things that we're talking about. Um, you know, I like how um, Dr. Crooks was, was talking about 
this this challenge of simultaneously uh, affirming these these positive narratives while at the same time calling out the fact that we've got these institutions um, and and these things that we're we're trying to name and identify so that we can separate ourselves from them. And um, you know, I, I I go back to um, to uh, the education again that I received at UCI in in about how in, in learning how to communicate in these spaces. Uh, one of the things that I, I believe is the most valuable about the work that I do is that it's about tying the experience of being a young black man in the hood who's dealt with abuse and the foster care system and all this other stuff, bridging the gap between that foreign world and this other foreign world where um, there's privilege and there's technology and there's empowerment and there's, uh, you know, acclaimed meritocracy. And I'm always find myself in the middle of this struggle to connect the two worlds and to do translation. Um, and it, it's not, I think that it's, it's hard work. It's not as hard as standing in front of a water hose or running from, from dogs. Um, or not being able to sell my own invention like Garrett A. Morgan, Lewis Latimer, Benjamin Batiker, um, CJ, Madam CJ Walker, you know, these innovators who struggle through, I think, uh, environments that at least physically were more harmful, um, if, if not mentally. Um, you know, I, I think about all that and I realize that I get to talk about white privilege at the end of the day and still get a paycheck. That's cool. Um, so if 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 I'm if I can use um, good communication and writing and all these things to to represent an experience and to have these conversations with people who would not otherwise have them um, if I weren't in the room, um, then that's something that I that I aim to do. And it is difficult, um, especially because the terminology changes so often. It used to be that we talked about just diversity back in 2013 when I joined Google. Then it was diversity and inclusion. Now it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, and uh, I think one of the challenges in the tech space is that uh, so much time is spent trying to figure out the language and um, the meaning of things um, to try to, uh, you know, really pin down and nail down what it is that tech as an industry is seeking to accomplish. And um, yeah, it, it's it, it's tough work, but I think it's important. It's something that we all need to think about and, and figure out to some degree. That actually takes me to um, one of my next questions and uh, just to be cognizant of everyone's time and almost being one o'clock, uh, we can always extend this for whoever wants to stay on, um, is what takeaways do you have for the audience when we talk about how can we be an impact with diversity and inclusion efforts, whether it's our personal life, professional life, um, you know, what are phrases or words to avoid? And, you know, what can, as an individual, like how can we make an impact as an individual or con uh, combat these misconceptions and we, you know, become allies. Um, and, you know, like Brian had kind of mentioned, diversity is for everybody, whether it is part of being of color, of gender, um, you know, and now as we speak about um, LGBT and uh, those communities as well, um, it, how kind of do we work together and become allies? So yeah, I can go first. Uh, so for, I think uh, for me, the takeaway here, it would be to say that I think one way, at least uh, uh, one way to deal with diversity is through education. So if you educate people, if people are educated, then they will find their place in society. If people are educated, people will be able to function in society in such a way that they will be have their place. Quickly to give an example about me, when I talk to people, so usually a small black man, with a heavy accent talking. So they always play it down. They always play down. But as soon as they know what degree I have, then everything changes. So everything uh, turn around. So that's the only way I, I believe we can uh, address 
this uh, problem with diversity. We need to educate our children. We need to educate uh, and create our families to educate our children. With, with that, uh, this is why I always talk about these programs because sometimes people want to be able to do something, but they can't. So they did this uh, so, something, need some, uh, some social support to help them uh, uh, to be able to accomplish what they can accomplish. So that's uh, my takeaway is to just address diversity through education, just educate uh, our children, educate our, uh, increase our family to, uh, to educate their children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, like Anthony mentioned, the, the time, I think. college gives you so much more than just the, the coding aspect, but all the other classes you also take and the exposure to those kind of people too, right? Yeah, and I'll, I'll um, one answer. So I, I would encourage everyone to think. Um, I, I think that if you want to get involved in, in DEI and making an impact, um, I, I think the 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 answer is very low tech. Uh, you don't need to have a degree in order to do it. Uh, a lot of this requires empathy. Um, really, is what it comes down to. You need to be able to imagine that you are in a situation where you don't have um, maybe the opportunities or the privileges. Um, that you have and think what would you want other people to do if you're in that situation um, whatever you come up with in your mind might be a good start it, it may not always be a good start but um, you know having the willingness to connect with people on a human level even in the workplace and that's one markedly different thing about these times than before is when I went to work I didn't talk about who I am what I believe in all that stuff I showed up did my work and got my paycheck now in uh, in 2021, we're having these conversations about identity and uh, race and inclusion. All these these things are confronting really hard topics, and it requires um, you know a, a lot of the uh, human elements that have always been important, uh, which is to say um, empathy, good communication, all the, those those kinds of things. So. You know, it, it, for some of you, it may manifest as find a coworker who. Um, who maybe doesn't share your same background, build a relationship, um, have a, start a conversation and a, build a friendship. And from that friendship can grow a tangible means of action um, where you both join in um, meaningful work. And so um, I, I think that that might be just some simple advice for folks. Um, and again, it's something you can do whether you have a degree or not. And, and just to add to that, if I may, Pooja, um, it, you know, there are some questions in the chat room and just in general about how, you know, what can, what can people do in general? And, and I, I think just two things, just, just as a basic core, like uh, Dr. Quicks had mentioned, to understand, acknowledge the history of this nation, okay, our institutions, the systemic bias in it, just to understand, acknowledge that as a step zero. Let's make sure we're all on the same page of how we got here um, and, and, and where we are today and why these institutions uh, are the way they are. If we, if we can acknowledge that, that that's, a, that's a core step. Number two is, is I, I would tell people who are really interested in how can I help to listen and digest. Just, just to listen, take it in, digest it. We don't need to have a, a come to a conclusion or X, Y, Z but digest it and, and try to think about why this other person feels that way or is adamant about something specific. Um, and, and then my second point is, you know, Pooja, you had asked about methods to deal with racism and bias. Uh, I, I have just two quick tenets of, I always tell myself, he who gets mad first loses. If you're having a conversation if it's you know uh, starkly wrong, if you lose it, you've lost. And either this is a teachable moment or not. So you either have a chance to educate, or we have a chance to, or it's time to escalate. And when I say educate, I mean hey, either this is a teachable moment, we're going to have a conversation about why this is X Y Z, why this is wrong, my perspective, or this is so stark out of the realm. You know, this is a this is an escalation path. You know, there's there's foundationally something wrong here, that you know our engagement is not going to be productive. So that's just you know that's just my thoughts on on how I personally deal with things. 
um, and and also what 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 would be helpful to the conversation is people to acknowledge and just simply listen um, and, and digest that. Yes, and what I typed in the chat room is, you know, February is we consider Valentine's Day and just loving um, one another. And I think that's should be a big takeaway is learning. And, you know, and even in Gisette's research, you know, when you're dealing with people with disability or amnesia and um, things like that, it's just loving each other and it doesn't matter the color or gender or sexual orientation or anything. It's really being compassionate and just, you know. It's not about diversity for just one person. It's for everybody. It's inclusion for everyone. So um, I, I'll still leave the conversation open, but that was some of you know my major questions that I had. Um, I know there's a few things in the chat room, but I think they were all similar to what I had asked. Um, whoever wants to stay on, I'll, 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 I will open the chat up. Um, so if you want to unmute yourself and ask any questions, I really wanted to thank each and every one of you for being on this panel and sharing your story, your research, your work. Um, and I really appreciate it. And I hope that, you know, we can continue some of this networking as we are an alumni chapter and really reconnect um, through all our social media platforms and with each other. And please join us next month again, also for Women's History Month. And you know, let's keep engaging and keep connecting and help create change. So I'll open it up for a few minutes um, for whoever wants to stay on. Uh, and, uh, thank you uh, for, um, for, for hosting this and for inviting me. It, it's quite an honor to be able to participate in this capacity because y'all didn't have to call a brother. Y'all didn't <laughs> have to do that. So I really appreciate it. Um, uh, one thing I'll, I'll say, uh, I've been thinking about writing an article. Um, don't tell anybody, y'all. This is just between uh, uh, I see uh But I'm thinking about writing an article called, um, what's the name? Romanticizing Inclusion, How Tech Struggles to Love Its Employees. Um, I think that there's something interesting, interesting in, in about, it, it's easy to sort, sort of throw that word love around without unpacking what that actually means and, and how that becomes a tangible thing in our work relationships. Um, you know, no one, again, years ago, uh, before I got to Google, no one talked about that. Um, love was something you did at home with your wife and your kids and, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, you know, in those contexts and not something that you did. I mean, you might talk about the work family, but even then we knew it wasn't like family. Um, and I think that there's something interesting to be said about how we're thinking about that concept as applied to um, the workplace and, and to the industry and, and what we're asking each other to do. Because um, I think that the, the things we're asking um, each other to do now is wholly different than what we used to ask each other to do when the business relationship was much more transactional um, and um, you know, paycheck oriented, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you and I'm glad that we're starting somewhere. And, um, it, uh, you know, kind of a last question and, you know, if you need to leave, I, I completely understand. Um, where do you think kind of social media plays into this because social media has grown so much, right? I mean, media has changed so much in the past 50 years with the TV and color TV and now the internet and now apps and everyone having a camera that they can record some of these injustices or, you know, you can also be a bully and hide behind the computer screen. Um, you know, is, is social media kind of been good or a hindrance yeah. or a positive? It's kind of like a tell of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Uh, me personally, I've benefited a lot from, from social media. Um, I have a platform and a voice that I would never have had um, in the previous generation. Uh, there's a BuzzFeed video about my life story called From Compton to Google. I, I tell people, you want to find me? Just put Compton and Google in the, in the search bar and I should pop right up. So social media has been positive positive from that perspective. But then I also look at Twitter and just the sheer vitriol that I'm exposed to every single time I log in. And, um, you know, if I ever want to find a garbage fire, I just know that I need to log into Twitter and in about, about 60 seconds, I'll find one. Yeah. So, um, 
I think we've taken. Yeah, that's interesting, money. right? With like them like turning off the president's account and stuff, and it's like yeah. where where's that right balance that a corporation can just do that? But that's another topic. So I mean, another really important um, class, and specifically in ICS, was the implications of of technology. Like we have all these tools for communicating, but at the same time, I think that we underestimate how difficult it is to properly and meaningfully communicate as human beings. So uh, when you see the explosion of tools for communication, but not a um, correlating growth in, in communication skills, I think you end up with what we have today, uh, which is in many situations, a hot flaming mess. Yeah, I think what might be interesting, and uh, yeah, I, I know Professor Crooks has signed off, I believe, um, is, you know, I wonder if there could be a class in this informatics realm that actually addresses, you know, these biases and kind of how do you make sure that you make this technology, whether it is for a disabled person or a person of color or gender and really incorporating these things because technology is the future and it's going to be integrated in so many different ways and in data science and informatics and really that implication of you know not having the face and being a bully whether you know whether you're a bully on social media or a proponent of change because um, I don't know I don't know is it like good that Twitter just shut down someone's account because today was the president what if they're like well, we're just going to shut down accounts of all black people. Like what stops the corporation from doing that next? And is that okay? Like how, you know, why is it a good, what's good, good for the goose versus the gander kind of story of, I don't know. Ooh, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I should let somebody else talk. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think, yeah, something, yeah, I, I want to say is there is a limit where actually you see in social media where actually, it's easy to figure out if it really this is okay for society or if this is not okay for society. So for, take the example of uh, our president, uh, you will see that he really went uh, too far. So he was really too far in, in trying to uh, reach uh, people too far trying to do things that ended up being so obvious for everyone that this is not good for society. So as long as a uh, social media artists or the companies, they limit themselves in that uh, uh, logic where actually they focus on the overall understanding how people uh, can be impacted, that would be fine. But again, uh, because of the history, because of what we know, uh, we always very concerned about being again the target, the minority again to be being target for this kind of uh, activities, for this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, shut down the way they did uh, with, with uh, the president uh, as we see in it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I guess the point is it's kind of scary, right? Because what if they had done that um, when all the marches and stuff were happening that, hey, we're just gonna shut these accounts off and that really impacts how the movement would have taken place. And is a company allowed to just do that? I mean, obviously it is a private company, but it's a little scary because there's so much power in some of these fake companies that exist. Like what if Google decides to do that next? Or, and are there regulations the government can put or not? You know, it's obviously a, a very maybe different topic for another day, but, you know, today was the president. What if next time it's all women or all people with disabilities and we just shut off their voice in essence? And, you know, it's I been mean, a great thing, right? Just like you said, that is for better or worse, like social media also has given people this voice and platform to express themselves that otherwise they wouldn't have had. I, I, the, the great thing about growing up Black in the hood is that I look at everything as a potential threat first um you know like everything is out to get me uh and that's just an assumption that i start with that that's not that's not where i like end up that's where i start right and so um and i think that that is a valuable perspective to bring um in tech because i think uh, much of the early success of silicon valley was oh, we've got this great idea and it's going to be a game changer and be empowering and it's going to bring so many positive benefits and blah, blah, blah. And no one's really thinking about 
the situations that we have today. And so tech companies get caught off guard. Um, I'll never forget there was a time when, um, uh, you know, this was in the news. So I'll speak to it from a personal perspective, not as an official uh, representative of, of my employer. Right. Um, but people were jumping on maps and they were labeling different places because you could label them and provide um, user input. And somebody um, uh, called the, changed the name for the White House to Nigger House when, um, when President Obama was in office. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about this. I'm just like, well, that was really unfortunate, but I'm also surprised that nobody saw that coming. <laughs> uh, you know, it, like, yeah, you give people the opportunity to say what they want to do, what they want, search for what they want. You're going to you're going to run into the ugly side of humanity very fast um, if you're not th thinking about that. And so I, I think that one of the responsibilities that I see myself as having in tech is to come with that um, paranoid, um, critical voice um, and, and say, look, you know, typically tools that empower people um, are, are often used to exert power uh, mm -hmm. over people who don't have yes. access to those tools. Yeah. Power struggle, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, my concern is that many of the students who graduate um, in today's times are, are quick to adopt new technology without fully thinking through the implications of what that technology can do for people who aren't like them or who don't, right? Um, you know, just, just thinking about technology from an American perspective um, can cause you to miss out on how that technology is being perceived in, uh, in places around the world, uh, in other places around the world. Mm. Um, you know, and that's one of the things I'm reminded of anytime I'm talking about DEI, um, a lot of the things, the perspectives that I bring sometimes are foreign to people that I talk to um, who, who aren't in America. You know, because a lot, of these, a lot of these things, sorry, some of these things are uniquely um, felt as, as an American, um, although it's not unique to the American context. Um, and so, yeah. I, well, color, for example, has been a big conversation in India. I don't know if you followed the, the um, there's a very popular cream called Fair and Lovely that was one of the biggest creams. Um, and I, I don't know if they're renaming it, but even, you know, even in India, there's a lot of caste and color inequality that exists so you know these problems i think do exist around the world in many, just in maybe different formations and because of different historical context or foundation um but yes judgment based on color or the uh, inequality of money does play a role kind of around the world right and and we want to make sure that the technology isn't making i guess it worse in a way right and it's it's out there <laughs> and Okay, well, um, it's a it's well past one o'clock and um, past lunchtime. So again, I want to thank anyone. If anyone has any last closing thoughts, then please share them. Otherwise, have a great Valentine's Day, and a, it's a short month. And you know, we'll see you next month for February uh, for our March lunch and learn. Thank you, Pooja. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you for setting us out. All right. Thank you. Have a good weekend. All right, you too. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye.